I define happiness as people's evaluations of their own lives, not what experts think of their lives, not what psychologists think of their lives, not what religious, what they think and evaluate and appraise their life. Is my life going well? They may do that by standing back and looking at their life, life satisfaction, at aspects of their life, my marriage, my work, my health. They may also do it moment to moment on an ongoing basis. How do I feel? I'm enjoying life. I love people. Those positive experiences tell us that our life is going well, the way we want it. Contrary-wise, negative feelings, anger, sadness, stress, tell us something's wrong with our lives. So we have all these various forms of subjective well-being, happiness, that we study in our lab. And in some ways, they're slightly different, but in many ways, they also overlap. So the first thing I want to tell you is, you folks here won the lottery already, and you don't know it. By being born in Canada, and one thing we know is that when immigrants come from those red countries and move to Canada, after a few years, their life satisfaction is just like other Canadians. That's how much influence where you come from makes, huge. Now let's look at Canada itself. Here's Canada, and you can see it also differs. Dark green is high, red is low. You can recognize eastern provinces, very high in life satisfaction. Northern provinces, low, lower. But let me just warn you that this is misleading because all these numbers are pretty high. So yes, these uh, indigenous people places are lower, but they're pretty high too, actually. In the world, that's like Europe, those scores. This is above Denmark. Here we are in British Columbia, light green, and as you see here, this is Denmark level or better. So again, you won the lottery. Canada is an extremely happy, satisfied place as it goes in the world. Of course you have problems, but things generally are going pretty well here. These two twins grow up to be psychologists. They're not psychologists yet here. Marissa and Mary Beth. Uh, this is a, at their pre-doc level. And <laughs> so they got to grow up together. But the, in the twin studies that are most powerful, the twins are separated right at birth and put up for adoption. It's unfortunate, but it happens. And the researchers go and find these twins around the world, average age 40, and test them on all different psychological scales and find out how similar they are in happiness. And it is amazing to see the results because those identical twins reared apart for 40 years are more similar in their happiness than dizygotic twins. And you know dizygotic, fraternal twins are just like brother and sister, genetically half on average similar. The identical twins who grew up apart are more similar than the twins who grew up together who were only half. That is powerful genetic evidence. What about money? And this is what we found 20 years ago. People have replicated it over and over. Declining marginal utility. That term of economists, what that means is the first amount of money you get, going from zero, they have a huge difference. But there is a declining amount at each margin as you go up. And so what this shows, it shows two types of happiness, uh, and, and they're the same. So one is affect balance, how much more positive affect you have than negative, one's life satisfaction, the latter scale. And then what you can see is when you're at zero, you're low in happiness. And when you go to 20,000, you've gone up a lot. And when you go to 40,000 household income, you go up quite a bit more. And then above that, it starts to go up very slowly, so that from 100,000 to 160,000, yeah, there's an increase, but it's very tiny. So meeting your basic needs, yes, money is very important. Uh, going from getting a Ford to a Mercedes, not so important. And what we now find, and I don't have the slide here for that, is there's actually starting to be a decrease. So you get up real high in income, you start to see people with 180,000 
are not as happy as people with 100,000 in many areas of the world. This is shocking. We don't know why it's not published yet. We're just finding this. So there's actually not just a flatness, which is what some people have found above this level, but actually a decline in happiness. If we studied the very happiest people, we said, okay, let's get the champs, the five to 10% of the really happiest people in the USA. And we found those people and we said, what characterizes them? We got all this information on them. And there was one thing that stood out because every single one of them, there was no exception. You know, a lot of times in psychology data, it's kind of, well, on average, it's this and I, no, this was 100%. Every one of them had strong social relationships and social support, every one of them. So we conclude that yes, social relationships are very important. And so everybody is saying, oh, you got to have social support. And, and everybody's doing research on social support. And I, of course, part of that is being trusted and respected. I'll show you more data on respect pretty soon. But then what we started to find and other people started to find, it's not just being supported. It is being a supporter. The very happiest people are not just those who have somebody to support them. They are the people who are supporting other people. They find so much purpose and meaning in giving to other people. And this is like a dramatic finding, right? Because it's not just sort of this internal thing of what you're getting, but what you're giving leading to happiness. So in our book that our son and I wrote, uh, we present a model we call the AIM model. And AIM stands for taking aim on happiness, but it's attention, interpretation, memory. Attention, what do you see out there in the world? What do you tend to notice? Do you tend to notice people's faults? Do you tend to notice people's good things they do? Because what we know is that attention is so powerful. We all think that we're just knowing everything going on around us. We don't. We focus on something and when we do that, we don't notice. And some people come to learn to focus on good things that people do, and others focus on bad things. And for, they live in two different worlds. For one of them, they live in a world of wonderful people. For the other, they live in a world of terrible people. Interpretation, when things are ambiguous, when somebody doesn't hold the door for you, are they in a hurry, or are they thoughtless and rude? Memory, what do you tend to remember? We see that happy people tend to remember more of the positive things from their life, Unhappy people remember more negative things, regardless of how many things have actually happened. Then we see things like gratitude, I mentioned before, being more grateful, learning to express your gratitude to other people, compassion, kindness, seeing the good in people, and not catastrophizing. This is huge. There's so much catastrophizing in the world. Oh my gosh, the world's going terrible. It's just all falling apart. Everything is terrible in this very thing, oh, isn't they, aren't things really terrible? And I said, no, remember this. There have been much worse things in the past. All through history, we had the plague kill half the people. We had World War I, we had the Holocaust, we had World War II, we had the Depression. I mean, come on. And one thing you have to understand is that the news is going to report the bad things much more than the good things. So the more attention you pay to the news and the media, the more you think the world's going bad, but every objective statistic is that things are actually getting better. There's less violence, there's longer longevity, the, even the poorest countries are getting richer, population growth is dropping all over the world pretty much, et cetera, et cetera. It's not surprising when you think about it for a moment, Happy companies have lower turnovers. People don't want to leave there. Well, turnover is very costly for companies. Searching for new people, training new people. So having lower turnover is big. Employee citizenship, we know, and this is the strongest effect, happy workers help other workers on the job. They go out of their way to be more likely to do things that's not that are not required by their job itself. Happy companies where happy workers are have greater customer loyalty. I mean, all you have to do is go into a restaurant or go into the dry cleaners or wherever, and the person's nasty to you, and, and maybe doesn't want, maybe they still have good prices and you'll still go there, but you're not quite as likely. 
And you go in other places, and I've seen it a lot here, by the way, in Canada. People are so friendly to you. You're like, wow, such a nice experience. That's why, another reason, companies do better. Happy workers take fewer sick days. Happy, you have lower health care costs. I'm going to show you the data on that in a moment. Happy workers tend to have more energy. People who are angry have energy, but they expend it in the wrong direction. People who are depressed do not have energy, and they have greater creativity. So lab studies, you put people in a positive effect, they become more creative. In the workplace, on days when people are happier, they think of more creative ideas for the workplace. So these are huge effects. Let me just sum this up by saying, do you have to be happy all the time? I asked the Dalai Lama this. He had just come out. This was over in Vancouver. I've talked to him a couple times. I think this is in Vancouver, British Columbia. And um, he said, oh, yeah, there's stupid happiness. You know, if a bear's going to get you, it's stupid to be happy. You ought to be afraid. It'll help you run faster, motivate you, and all these things. Well, that's the same with happiness. Of course, you don't want to be happy at your mother's funeral or happy every moment. And there are things in the world you need to be concerned about. We find that happy people are still concerned about global warming and these various things. They may still think... Uh, Donald Trump isn't a good president, you know, et cetera. It's not like they walk around in a cloud. They understand the world. And furthermore, the interesting thing is, even if they worry a little less about these things, they are more likely to take action to do something about it. Depressed people, not likely to take action, just complain about it. Self-esteem and happiness are very strongly related in the US, so much so that we came to think self-esteem was the key to happiness. You had to like yourself. Then Marissa, our daughter, and I did a study where we looked around the world, and we found that in India, for women, self-esteem didn't predict happiness at all. And we interviewed, Robert interviewed people, and the, and the woman would say, oh, no, how my kids are, uh, self-esteem, of course, I'm doing fine. We all know how to cook and take care of our kids and be a good homemaker. And if my sons are doing well, that's what's important to my happiness. Self-esteem, I, I, I don't even think about that. So self-esteem is a very individualistic, Western idea. And yes, it does predict here, but it doesn't predict in more collectivist cultures, where other things, how much other people think about you, is much more important than what you think about yourself. That religious people are indeed happier, as you see the studies show, but only in religious countries. Saudi Arabia, you better be religious. You better not be an atheist. You're in big trouble. But in Sweden, the least religious of all the countries, it doesn't matter. In fact, you might be a little happier if you're not religion, but it's really pretty much, you see here, the same. So being congruent with your culture, we find over and over, matters for happiness. And if your culture emphasizes one thing, being that thing makes it a little easier. Can we increase happiness? So professors Lutz and Wirtz here in your psychology department have worked with me on this intervention to increase happiness called Enhance. And we have quite a few of the first group of people who participated in Enhance here with us tonight in the audience. So I'm grateful to all of you for being here and doing that. So here is what Enhance is. 10 weeks, 10 different lessons. You practice them. You write about them, about your values, your goals. What are your strengths? When do you use your strengths? Mindfulness, meditation kind of stuff, learning that technique learning to deal with the negative, savoring things from your past, remembering more good things from your past, not just bad, close relationships. You know, so many of us notice when our spouses do something wrong or screw up, but we forget about all the times they do good things, and we don't mention them and don't even notice them. They've done them so many times. They've done the dishes so much. They've cooked dinner so much. They've taken out the guard. You know, we don't even mention it. And what I'm saying is, OK, you remember to encourage your kids and reinforce them and say thank you to your kids and all that. But then you start ignoring all the adults around you. That's mostly what we do. Gratitude, social interactions, and kindness, compassion. So we spend one week on each of these. And what we find is some good outcomes. In study one, 
that's just uh, being submitted for publication now. We found that positive affect is up, life satisfaction is up, self-esteem is up in the people who participated compared to the waitlist control group. And on the negative end, depression's down, negative affect's down. All these results are significant, and some of them are pretty substantial. So we've done well. <laughs>